world tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong, bringing you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Herbert W. Armstrong. Well, greetings, friends. This is Herbert W. Armstrong with the good news of the world tomorrow. And now, my friends, get out your Bibles and see some things that are going to astonish you. Why is it that you have been brought up to believe exactly the opposite of what the Bible says? That is, to believe that it says exactly the opposite of what it does. Why is it that you have accepted a gospel you have thought was the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is exactly the opposite, which is a gospel about Christ, about his person, but which denies his teaching and teaches exactly the opposite from what he did? What's the truth about hell fire? What's the truth about hell? Is there a hell? Have people ever gone to hell? We're going to come into that now. If you'll open your Bible, Mark, the ninth chapter, and we're beginning now the 38th verse. Here we are going through the life of Jesus Christ to see what he taught, to see the example that he set, to see the customs that he practiced, how different they were from those that we practice today. Was he wrong? Did he do the wrong things? Are we right today? Are we better than he was? How did it get started? And incidentally, my friends, let me just tell you this. A lot of you have thought that Jesus Christ came preaching an Old Testament gospel that, well, he spent three and a half years preaching it just in order to nail it to the cross and do away with it and knock it in the head as soon as he got through teaching people to observe it. And that wouldn't have been very smart, now would it? And yet a lot of people think that's exactly what Christ did and that Paul brought a new religion for Gentiles and that Christ had to preach to the Jews because, well, for some reason he couldn't get out of it or something. But as soon as he got through preaching to them, he knocked it all in the head and did away with it. You know, a lot of these things people have come to believe are so inconsistent, if you just stop to think, it will amaze you. And so a lot of people say, well, you know, we're not Jews, we're, we're Gentiles. And we believe in that gospel that Paul preached. But if you'll study your Bible, if you'll read in the book of Acts, if you'll study the epistles or the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote that form a part of the Bible, you will see that he taught exactly the same gospel that Jesus Christ had taught. You will read in Galatians of how he didn't get his gospel from men. He got it directly from Christ, and he got exactly the same gospel that Christ had taught the disciples. I went into that before in a preceding program how that Paul did not confer with men. He didn't go to the apostles. But he went directly to Christ, and he said, I have been with Christ, I have seen Christ. But when he did later go down to Jerusalem and compare notes with Peter and with James and with John, and to find out what they preached and what he did, they found they both preached exactly the same gospel, and then they gave him the right hand of fellowship that he should go to the Gentiles and they to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, here we are now in the ninth chapter of Mark and the 38th verse. Now, John said to Jesus, Master, we saw one casting out demons in thy name, and we forbade him because he followed not us. He didn't follow. He didn't do as they did. He didn't follow Jesus. Now, we have that situation today. There are many who go about doing things in Jesus' name. That is, they come out in his name, and very often they are deceiving the people. God Almighty could have stopped them. He could have closed up their churches. He didn't. He's let them go ahead. You know why? If you understand the gospel that Jesus preached... If you know the purpose of God and the plan of God in working out that purpose, you will understand. This, my friends, is the time when God is letting human beings express their free moral agency, when he is letting them learn lessons the hard way by experience. That's the only way the purpose of God can be fulfilled. And I want to tell you, many are deceived, and God knows it. It's foretold in the Bible that the many would be deceived, not the few. God knows that. God could have prevented it. God could have stopped it, but he didn't. God could have stopped wars, and there wouldn't be any wars today. God allows war. Why? Well, for the simple reason that God allows sin. 
You know what war really is? I've expressed it before on this broadcast. War is a penalty that human beings pay. It's a penalty of transgression. War is a penalty of disobeying the laws of God. The law of God is love. The law of God is loving your neighbor as yourself. It's the way of peace. Men don't know that way. They don't follow it. The only way God could stop war would be to cram his religion down our throats. The only way God could stop war would be to enforce his law on people and make everybody obey it. That way is the way of love. God's law is love. It requires the love of God by the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts to fulfill that law. Now, God could, I suppose, crack down on us and cram his truth down our throats and force his Holy Spirit into every one of us and just make us show forth love and and be at peace with our neighbors. But he hasn't done it. No, God Almighty has let these little strutting dictators rise up and uh, with their rabble-rousing uh, oratory, uh, he has let the le- people listen and follow it like dumb sheep like they have done in some of the nations of the earth. He has permitted these men to become heads of aggressor nations and to be aggressors and to uh, develop great tremendous armies and to attack our people. God has permitted it. And God permits people to take his name and go out and preach wrong things in it. This is not the time when God is trying to stop them. And by the same token, my friends, this is not the time when God is trying to save the whole world. Now, that's about the most astonishing thing that some of you have ever heard. But if you'll read your Bibles a little more, you'll see that it's true. You'll see that what you have been taught that the Bible says is the opposite in very many cases. Well, let's read on. Jesus didn't stop these people. Verse 42, Whatsoever shall cause one of these little ones that believe on me to stumble, it were better for him if a great millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand cause thee to stumble, if your hand causes you to stumble, so that that is, it's going to cause you the loss of salvation, cost you your eternal life, cut it off. Cut off that hand if it's going to deny you eternal life. Cut it off. It is good for thee to enter into life maimed, that is, into eternal life. And in this case, the Bible is speaking of life as the life that God has to give, not the existence with which we were born. Now, actually, from this point of view, all we have is a mechanical existence. We're like an alarm clock, not an electric one either, but one that's going to wound up and it's going to run down. Of course, the electric clock is going to stop whenever you turn off the current. It'll go as long as the current's on. And as long as it works, sometimes they break down, don't work anymore, something else goes wrong with them. But we're all starting to run down, and physically we become rather old at 30 years of age, you know. An athlete is an old man by the age of 30, physically. And we should continue to gain uh, morally and mentally and spiritually for quite some time. But actually, we're deteriorating. We're running down, if we can realize it. And God has life to give. And that life is in His Son, Jesus Christ. And whosoever has the Son of God does have life. But the Bible says in 1 John 5 that whosoever has not the Son of God has not life. No, you're dying while you yet live. We're all just dying That's all. All the time, gradually, we're running down. We don't realize it. We're not going to live forever. Some people begin to realize it when they approach age 70. About that time, they begin to think. But while they're young, they think they're going to live forever. They have no time for God. They have no time to consider uh, what's going to happen after death. They're not concerned. They're living now, and uh, they're just going to enjoy the present. And they want to get the maximum sensations and and uh, exhilarations and everything of that sort out of the moment, and they aren't even concerned about what happens tomorrow or about the consequences of what they do today. That's why a lot of people that are a little older are suffering from what they did when they're younger. And a lot of people that are younger and doing those things now are going to suffer a little later. Now, if thy hand cause thee to stumble, cut it off. It is good for thee to enter into life. And here life means eternal life maimed rather than having thy two hands to go into hell as it is in the King James and in the American Revised Version. Into the unquenchable fire. Now, what is the truth about this matter, hell? You know, a lot of people have been trying to find hell. 
And I remember years ago, one man thought he had discovered it. There was a big story, I think it was in a feature uh, section of a Sunday newspaper. It might have been one of the magazine sections of a Sunday paper. I don't remember now. A long, long time ago. And anyhow, as I remember it, this man thought that uh, hell was on the surface of the sun and heaven was inside the sun. That the sun had a, it was hollow and it was very beautiful inside there. And of course the sun, you know, is many, many, many times bigger than this earth. It's a pretty big ball and there would be a lot of space. So this fellow reasoned it out in his own mind. Of course that didn't make it true and it isn't true incidentally, but that's the way he reasoned it out. And that uh, the flaming heat of the sun was the hell fire where people go. And another man one time thought that uh, hell is down the center of the earth. It's supposed to be a molten mass, and so that's where everybody goes, that, and a lot of people that have died are there. Well, of course, when we read about the resurrection, I don't know why there'd have to be a resurrection and then a judgment which follows the resurrection in which those that have been dead are to be judged to see whether they should have been sizzling in hell all these years or not, and maybe a mistake was made and they got to go up to heaven after that. You know, it just wouldn't make sense, would it? It just wouldn't make sense. Why should there be a resurrection from the dead if the dead are already living and not dead but are in hell or up in heaven? And then again, why if anyone has been up in heaven and all that wonderful heavenly bliss that they picture to you, and they've been up there for a thousand or five thousand years or a hundred years or something like that, enjoying all of that, why is it, my friends, that they should be brought back in a resurrection to this awful, terrible earth and go into a judgment to decide whether they belonged up in heaven or not? Why not have the judgment before they go there? You know, in this world, even human beings are more just than they seem to think God is. Now, uh, actually, I'm telling you that this uh, thing they think is not the truth, and God isn't doing that at all. But what people seem to think God does is that he sends them either to heaven or hell, and then he brings them down to look at it and have the judgment and the trial to see whether they should be there. Now, a judgment is a trial. That's what it is, to see whether you're innocent or guilty. That's exactly what a judgment is. And there is a day of judgment coming. The great judgment day is coming, and it comes, according to your Bible, after the resurrection. What's the use of having a resurrection in order to have a judgment follow those that are resurrected if they have already gone to their reward or to their punishment one way or the other? You know, you don't send a criminal or a suspected criminal, one that is accused, you don't send him to the penitentiary for 25 years and let him serve the 25-year penalty for what he did and then, and then have a judgment or a trial to see whether he's guilty and see whether he should have been given some great reward instead of having been punished or not. It doesn't make sense, does it? Well, now the truth of it is that this word hell is an English word and it had an entirely different meaning when the King James translation was made, or the King James revision, because actually it was more of a revision than a translation. Anyway, that was back in the year of 1611. And in the original language in which the Bible was written, and all we have are English translations in the English language, and of course over in Germany they have the German translations, mostly over there they... They have the Lutheran translation, and uh, then the uh, other nations have their translations in their languages. Now, the Old Testament mostly was written in Hebrew, and all of the New Testament was written in the Greek language. But we don't speak Greek. You say, well, that's Greek to me. That means you don't understand it, because very few people understand Greek. And uh, it wasn't even the modern Greek that the people speak in Greece today. It was the Greek of that time, and even the Greek language has undergone changes, too, and is somewhat different today. And uh, so, in translating this English word hell from the original languages in which it is written, let me just explain quickly, and I can't take the time to give it all to you because it would take more than one whole broadcast to do it. But anyway... There are three Greek words, all of which they have translated into the English word hell, and there is the one Hebrew word. The one Hebrew word, Sheol, 
is used, and it means usually the grave, and every place you find the word grave in the Old Testament, I think every place, so far as I remember now, every place is Sheol in the original. And uh, some places they translate it in the hell, but usually it's Sheol or grave. Now, in the New Testament, the corresponding word is Hades, H-A-D-E-S. That is a Greek word. In most places in the New Testament, Hades is the word in the original language that Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, or the other writers used. Now, in this particular case, the word is not Hades, but the word is Gehenna. And Gehenna is another Greek word. It has an altogether different meaning. Now, the word Hades always did mean a hole in the ground, a grave that is covered up. Now, today, the uh, higher critics and some of the theologians trying to back up their pagan superstitions that they have put into a so-called Christianity are trying to hang on to that, a definition of the abode of departed spirits and all that sort of thing. Well, that's a rather fanciful and new definition. But the actual meaning of Hades is the grave. And it is a place where they are buried. And to be buried, they have to be covered up. It's a place of burial. And uh, in most of the places where the word hell is used, it is not referring to fire at all, or hell fire, but is referring to a grave. Now, in this particular case here in Mark 9, and also you will find it in Matthew 18 and uh, verse 8, and in other places in the Bible, the word is Gehenna. Now, Gehenna was the name of a place at the south border of the city of Jerusalem. It was down off of a high ledge. There was a bank and a high uh, a ledge up above it. This is down at the bottom, and it was a place that was not used for any other purpose. In other words, it wasn't a business or a residential section or anything of that sort. But they dumped over refuse and uh, uh, trash and uh, the bodies of dead animals and even criminals. When they died, their bodies, their dead bodies, were thrown over that ledge. And down below, the fires were kept burning continually. And I presume that they had attendants down there to see that the fires kept burning and keep everything aflame, otherwise it would soon burn up and burn out. But they kept dumping things down, and it took more and more things dumped over that ledge, over the precipice at the top, to drop down to continue to keep those fires fed so they would continue to burn. Because, you know, fire finally burns the thing up, and then it just stops. You don't quench it, you don't put it out, but it just goes out when it's burned up, whatever was being burned. Now, if you have studied fire, it's a matter of very elementary chemistry, and I think a good many of you studied that in high school. And uh, if you did, you found that fire is a chemical process. It's a matter of chemical action of material substance. It is the combining of the substance with the oxygen in the air in a chemical matter now, a certain life or a certain energy has to be imparted to it, like the spark that ignites the gasoline in your automobile. And actually, when you strike a match, it's like a sort of a spark. It starts a fire, and uh, uh, that will ignite other things. And once it is started, that action will continue. It is the uniting of the oxygen in the air with the product being consumed. Now, what it does, it consumes the product. And it changes it into a different uh, condition. Now, our, our scientists, our physicists tell us that it is not uh, dis actually uh, destroyed. That is the matter itself. The, the thing or the substance in the form or shape in which it was is totally destroyed. But the matter that composed it is not. But part of it is left as ash on the ground or wherever it is. And part of it goes up in smoke and gas up into the air. It's just changed into a different form. Now, part of it has been changed into gas or into smoke, and part of it has been changed into ash. And that's what happens to a thing that is burned. It is just changed into a different kind of physical substance altogether. And it is a process of destruction that destroys it in the form or shape in which it was. 
Now, Jesus is talking about having two hands go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. Now, they never let them quench that fire. No one was allowed to go down there and put the fire out. They couldn't pour water on it. They couldn't call out the fire department or anything like that. They simply let it burn until it burned up the things that were in it. Now, back in the Old Testament, you will read that the wicked are not only going to perish, but they're going into a fire so hot it will burn them up. It will burn them up. And you read that they are to be ashes under the soles of the feet of those that are given eternal life and go on living forever. That's what your Bible teaches. And Gehenna was exactly that picture. Now, Gehenna fire did not in any manner, shape, or form picture anything that would just burn and keep burning and burning and burning forever. It didn't picture anything of the sort. Now, let me give you an illustration about unquenchable fire. If you will take, just take a piece of paper because that'll burn about as quickly as anything. Set it in a pan so it can't catch anything else on fire. Take a pan, put a piece, a little piece of paper in it, and set it on fire with a match. And watch it. And now don't you quench that fire. Don't quench it. Just let it burn. You won't have to wait hardly a minute if it's a little piece of paper. And you'll see some flame and gas going up and a little smoke. And after a while, you'll have a little black piece of ash left. And if it's on the floor, you can step on it and... The ashes will be under the sole of your feet. And there you are. And that's what happens to the wicked according to your Bible. But that isn't what you've heard taught. That isn't what you've been brought up to believe, most of you. That's what the Bible says. And so I tell you, my friends, they've turned the Bible upside down. Now this Gehenna fire, this hell is Gehenna, which was a place that burned up whatever was put into it. Now we read back here just a few days ago how Jesus said that the man to fear was the one who could destroy the soul as well as the body in Gehenna fire. And there again he was speaking of Gehenna, not of Hades, but Gehenna. Now uh, where the word Hades is used, and it's, it's always hell in your Bible, you don't know the difference until you get the Greek copy of the original. But in the original, in some places, it is Hades. And wherever the word Hades is used, it never talks about burning. And it never talks about destroying them or burning them up. That's always where the word Gehenna is used. And it is referring to this fire that burned them up. It's a lot hotter than one that just burns you but doesn't burn you up. That wouldn't be a very hot fire. No, the real hell fire that Jesus talked about, and he did talk about a fire that will burn them up. Now, if you want to know about that fire, it is described over here in the book of Revelation. And uh, in the 20th chapter of Revelation. And finally, the last three verses. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. This is the last and final resurrection. You know, the Bible talks about more than one resurrection. And it talks of the first resurrection and so on, and then a second resurrection. Well, this is the last resurrection. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell. Now there, that's Hades, not Gehenna, but Hades. That's the grave. Gave up the dead which were in them. Now those dead weren't burning. They were just in a grave. They were covered up. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. You know that word Hades, called hell. Well, that was the original meaning of hell in England back in the early 17th century, in the 16th century, and the early 17th century when the King James translation was made. And you know that back there at that time in England, the people talked about putting their potatoes in hell for the winter. Sure, they put their potatoes in hell. Now, that means they dug a hole in the ground, they put their potatoes in it, they covered them up, and it's a very fine way to preserve potatoes for the winter. You might try it sometime. It's a, a nice way to protect and preserve potatoes. Just bury them in the ground. And uh, some of you people living up in Idaho know what I mean, those wonderful potato sellers that you have up there in Idaho, uh, partly under the ground at least, but pretty well covered up on top too. And it's a place to protect and to preserve potatoes. Well, those great big potato caves up there in Idaho, you might call them hells. That's what they are. And the Greek word is Hades. Now, that's what is used here. 
death and hell, or Hades here, which means the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Now there is the judgment. And now they decide what happens to them. And death and hell, or Hades, that's the grave, as those resurrected out of there were cast into the lake of fire. This is the hell fire, a lake of fire. This is the second death. It's a second death, and that death is for all eternity. Now, my friends, what does your Bible say? Does your Bible say that the wages of sin is eternal life in hell fire? Now, you've been taught that. That is, you've been taught to believe that. That if a person dies, that he will live forever in hell fire. Haven't you been taught that? Well, that is not what the Bible says. But it says the wages of sin is death, D-E-A-T-H. And it is eternal punishment. It is not eternal punishing. It is eternal punishment. And the punishment is death. And that death is for all eternity. It is not a temporary death. It is an eternal death. Now, it's appointed to all men once to die. We die this first death. Because of Adam's sin, we all die. But the death that you die because of your own sins, if you are not pardoned by the blood of Jesus Christ, and if you do not receive eternal life as the gift of God, that death is the second death from which there will be no resurrection. That is eternal death. That is your punishment, and that is eternal punishment. Now, there's the truth in a few words about this matter of hell. And the wicked are going to perish. God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. The word is perish. But you've been taught to believe, live forever in hell fire. Now, right away you'll think about Lazarus and the rich man, won't you? Well, let me tell you something. Lazarus, who people think was up in heaven, was able to look down and see this rich man in what they think was a burning hell and talk to him. And they saw him, they heard his screams and his, his, his yelling, but couldn't help him a bit. If that is true, if what you have thought about Lazarus and the rich man is true, then I tell you, my friends, that saved mothers up in heaven are hearing the shrieks of their lost children in hell. They're seeing them, they're talking to them, but can't help them. Would that be heaven? Because of the importance of this subject and other related topics, we are pleased to offer the following free literature. One of the central themes of almost every religion is the concept of judgment to an ever-burning hellfire. Guilty. Banished to hell. We've all heard versions of hell which portray the devil and his cohorts fiendishly tormenting the wicked. Oh, come on now. Where did these ideas begin? How could a loving God sentence man to eternal torment of any kind? Is there a real hellfire? What does your Bible really say about hell? These questions are answered in the booklet, Is There a Real Hellfire? Your copy is free of charge. Send for it now. Is there a real hellfire? <laughs> So now, this is Herbert W. Armstrong saying goodbye, friends, until tomorrow and daily on most of these stations. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong.